Well, welcome back to this fascinating series that Michael Horner has been taking us through on the, the current urban myth that has been embraced by our culture that religion and specifically in this case Christianity has had a very bad influence on history and what we're seeing is the actual track record of history tells a very different story. And today, uh, Michael, I understand you're going to talk to us about what you call the real problem. So uh, why don't you clarify that for us? And Right. Well, um, the way to clarify it is by just doing a quick summary of what we have accomplished in this most recent section of our episodes. Uh, we're trying to um, answer the question, uh, is Christianity harmful for human flourishing? And um, I mean, the title of, of our whole uh, YouTube channel here and podcast is Influential Myths. And so I've been trying to point out that there are some myths that have been very influential. Um, and we have looked at the positive things that Christianity has done. But then we also have been looking at the blemishes. We've taken quite a bit of time to look at the sort of more, most notorious blemishes that people bring up and 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 base a conclusion that Christianity is harmful to human flourishing on. And we've seen that in reality, Christians have done and they can do and have done evil. But then we've asked the question compared to what? Because the context is the whole world throughout all of history does evil. So, you know, what are we comparing it to? We've also seen that uh, these notorious blemishes, um, the numbers are almost always hugely exaggerated to what actually happened. We also saw those mitigating circumstances that often should make us question whether we really would have done much better in the same circumstances, even though these mitigation circumstances um, Circumstances do not uh, justify the behavior, but it, it should cause us to be a little bit less uh, judgmental. I think. We also notice that when Christians do bad things, it's not because they're being too Christian, because they're not being Christian enough. <laughs> uh, and we've seen that even though only a small minority of the world throughout history have been non-religious or irreligious, when they gained access to power, They've actually caused more wars, violence, and deaths. Not only per capita, given that they're a much smaller po population of the uh, history of the of the earth, but uh, just in the 20th century alone, the total numbers far exceed the rest of history of uh, that's been done through any Christian violence. And then we focus for a couple of weeks on the myth of violence. We've seen that the evidence actually does not support this, this view, this common influential myth that religion has an intrinsic, unique tendency towards violence that secular or non-religious ideologies don't. Ideologies like patriotism, capitalism, Marxism, liberalism, they don't lack uh, these. These ideologies are no less prone to be absolutist, divisive, and irrational than belief in, for example, the biblical God. So says William Kavanaugh, who has researched and written the book, The Myth of Violence. And in fact, this myth of religious violence was constructed by Enlightenment thinkers, he argues, as a way of leveraging the Thirty Years' War as proof of the inherent violence of religion. Why? Well, in order to marginalize the religious and promote the nation state as the peaceful solution and alternative. But Kavanaugh demonstrates that the evidence shows that many of the alleged wars of religion failed to meet the four criteria to actually be the cause. One, combatants being motivated by religious difference. That was one of the criteria not met. Secondly, the primary cause being religion, that wasn't met three religious causes being analytically separable from other causes, political, economic, and social causes, not met. And fourth, the modern state was not a cause of the wars itself, not met. In fact, he says it 
in each of these cases, the opposite is the case. And therefore, his conclusion was, we must conclude that the myth of the wars of religion is finally incredible. And he defines his use of the word there, which is to say false. So that brings us to this conclusion. War and violence against others is a human problem. It's not a uniquely religious problem or even specifically Christian problem. And removing God only makes things worse, not better. And we saw that when we looked at the irreligious examples of violence and war. So John Dixon, the Australian historian that we've been uh, quoting a, a number of times, he calls this the heart of the problem. I'm not suggesting that because atheists are responsible for more bloodshed than Christians, the church somehow comes out looking okay. He says such a mathematical argument would be perverse. In some ways, he admits Christian cruelty is morally worse than Christian than atheist cruelty, precisely because it betrays the Christian convictions. Because there's uh, there's a hypocrisy going on. The Christians are not acting according to the way they're supposed to be acting, according to the teachings of their founder. But Dixon says my argument is simpler and hopefully uncontroversial. I'm saying that the real problem is neither religion nor irreligion. The problem is the human heart in possession of a misdirected passion. Passion for power, land, rights, honor, wealth, or yes, even religion. My good friend, the philosopher uh, Paul Chamberlain uh, from Trinity Western University, he drives this point home in his wonderful book, about why people don't believe. Quote, the plain fact is that due to human nature, all ideals, however wonderful they start out, are capable of being abused. Since this is so, we need to figure out what to do about it, rather than simply lashing out at one of those ideals, religion, as if it, as if it were the true cause of the violence. Doing that makes as little sense as lashing out at liberty and equality because of the horrendous consequences of their abuse during the French Revolution. This misses the mark and leaves the root problem untouched. A lot of wisdom there. Now, I, um, I like the uh, music artist Bruce Coburn, Canadian artist, and uh, he has a song called Justice. Now, I am not planning on singing it for you, and I'm not familiar with the legalities enough to even play it. But I am going to read you the, uh, the lyrics of the uh, main part of the song here uh, uh, to help illustrate what we're talking about. The song's called Justice, and he begins, What's been done in the name of Jesus? Ooh, right away I was a little nervous about that. Oh, no, he's going to be... Uh, He's going to be attacking Christianity. Christianity is doing all these horrible things. But the next line is, what's been done in the name of Buddha? And the next line, what's been done in the name of Islam? Oh, no. So he's, you know, he's going broader. It's all religions that are the problem here. And then he says, and what's been done in the name of man? Oh. And what's been done in the name of liberation? So now we're talking about maybe humanism and... Marxism, and in the name of civilization, ooh, maybe liberal democracy, and in the name of race, and in the name of peace, everybody loves to see justice done, he says. And then there's a pause in the song, and it says, on somebody else. Now, I love this because he... <laughs> He, he kind of tricked me. I thought he was going to attack Christianity, and I thought he was going to attack uh, religion. Uh, but then he kind of got all the isms. He's making his point very well that any good ideology can have horrible things done in its name, and has. Why? Because, well, we all love to see justice done. Justice, we know justice is a good thing. We want to promote justice, but we can all too easily fall into sin in our zeal regardless of our ideology so much harm has been done in the name of almost any noble pursuit that flawed humans undertake 
not just Christians, not just religious, but any idealistic attempt to do good and promote justice. Uh, Dixon and Chamberlain and others are right. It's a human problem. Human beings are the problem. Nixon talks about the Marxist Terry Eagleton, who's written of the attraction that he feels toward the biblical concept of the fallenness of humanity, uh, you know, of original sin and of real evil. This Marxist writer says he's he is correspondingly scathing of what he calls the dewy-eyed optimism of much contemporary atheist chatter about humanity's progress. He speaks of the, quote, staggeringly complacent belief that we are all becoming kinder and more civilized. In recognizing this evil in all of us, whether the Christian crusade, the Enlightenment terror, or modern pornography's complicity in human trafficking, we will become a little more understanding toward our fallen selves and a little less judgmental of others. The temptation of our age is to elevate our particular time and place as the crescendo of human purity and achievement. And that necessarily involves speaking ill of the past. And so we talk about the dark ages, partly so we can tell ourselves that we live in the light. It's a way of exempting ourselves from the guilt of humanity. It's a human problem, not a unique problem of Christianity or religion. You don't need to be religious to have a dangerous inclination to want to bend others to your own views. It just so happens that most people throughout history have been religious, not atheists. So any ideology or worldview is capable of resorting to violence to promote or defend its position because it's humans that hold views and beliefs and positions. And human beings seem to have a proclivity to self-centeredness and even violence. And this is consistent with exactly what Christian teaching affirms, what Jesus affirmed, that humankind is fatally flawed. Jesus says the heart is deceitful above all things. It's a problem of humans, not religion. So Alexander Solzhenitsyn pinpointed the problem even more precisely when he stated, if only there were evil people somewhere insidiously committing evil deeds and it were necessary only to separate them from the rest of us and destroy them. But the line dividing good and evil cuts through the heart of every human being. Wiser words. <laughs> yeah, I really like that quote because uh, I think it's there's there's a lot of truth in it. Um, I think part of what you're saying there with regard to the human problem, there's two things specifically that came to mind when you were talking there, Michael. One is the human problem of uh, scapego scapegoatism. Mm -hmm. And that is we like to be able to shovel our, shovel the failings of history and so forth onto some particular group that can be used as a scapegoat. And that includes even individuals, you know, trying to pass the, the blame on to other people or even the blame on to maybe their environment or whatever. We, I mean, it's almost instinct for every one of us. I, I wouldn't accuse everybody in this, but I know it's certainly an instinct in myself to, if there's an issue uh, that somehow I'm not looking too good at, for whatever reason, there's this first primal instinct to look at something else other than me as the cause. So that's the first thing that came to mind. And often, unfortunately, um, Christianity has become a scapegoat, especially in our culture, in that sort of sense. And often when we want to use this person as a scapegoat or a people group as a scapegoat, we'll actually use a particular failing of theirs to justify our using them as the scapegoat, and I can certainly see much evidence for that in um, Christianity's uh, role in the Crusades and the Inquisition and witch trials and so forth, which, uh, as you pointed out, have been grossly exaggerated and were not at all what Jesus taught. Nevertheless, uh, they were blemishes. And so if one uses a, the blemishes on a potential scapegoat as the reason for scapegoating them, 
then a lot more can be um, a lot more blame can be piled onto that group and it looks like this has been done with Christianity. The other thing that came to mind as you were talking regarding human nature and it's uh, it's sort of similar related to scapegoatism but not quite. Sometimes you will have individuals who want to do things that the general population might be a little reluctant to permit, but if that individual somehow hijacks something that's greatly respected in that society and uses it, and I think um, that song, the lyrics of the song you pointed out, uses it to promote their own agenda. It might be in the name of some religion, it might be in the name of uh, some particular racist um, feelings in the population, it might even be in the name of peace, peacekeeping forces. Um, somehow, so all of these things can be used. National security, what has been done in the name of national security. So uh, there's this idea that when it comes to Christianity in the societies where it's been greatly revered, it's a primary target to be used by the unscrupulous to try and hijack that to accomplish their own nefarious objectives or to motivate the population, maybe even speaking religiously. Um, you're trying to use some sort of religious grounds to motivate the population to come on board. But those, those are two things that came into mind as you were talking there, scapegoatism and the human nature tendency to wanna invoke something of high reputation in order to justify their own agenda, whatever that might be. Yeah. No, that's a good addition. Thank you for adding that. I like what the journalist Brian Killian uh, wrote on this topic. He says, of course, religion has been and will be used for evil purposes. And there are such things as deviant religions and deviant religious behavior. But it should be obvious that religion is not inherently evil or a necessary cause of it. The sad fact is that men will kill each other for just about anything. Religion, race, ethnicity, politics, rival sports teams. And judging by the ocean of blood spilt by atheistic regimes in the last century, atheism doesn't exactly have any moral high ground to stand on. And so he repeats what we're trying to say in this episode, that the problem is not religion, but human beings. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceeds evil thoughts, Jesus said. So from the very beginning of Christianity, Christians have been at the forefront of bringing positive social reform and practical assistance to people in need. It was through the early Christians that newborns, potential victims of infanticide, were saved from death and brought into families. It was through the early Christians that the gruesome gladiatorial combats were brought to an end. Who first took medicine into the third world and opened hospitals? Who first reached out to lepers? Who sheltered orphans? who spread literacy and established schools and universities, and who led movements to abolish the slave trade and apartheid, child labor laws, and established civil rights. Who most often adopts children? Who sponsors the nation's food pantries and soup kitchens? It is Christians who've always been on the forefront of helping people in need and treating all people with dignity, regardless of their handicaps. And it's also worth pointing out that much more good has been done by Christianity than bad. Even Michael Shermer, president of the Skeptic Society, acknowledges that for every one of these atrocities, or what we call blemishes done by Christians, which must, which must cause all of us deep concern, there are 10,000 unreported acts of kindness, generosity, and so forth, rising from, from religious commitment. Now, this is getting at the segue that I want to use here. Uh, another example of, of an atheist making a similar point was Voltaire, to whom Christianity was an infamy that deserved crushing. But he found the influence of faith useful among the masses. Quote, he says, I want my attorney, my tailor, my servants, even my wife to believe in God, he wrote, because then I shall be robbed and cuckolded less often. He once silenced the discussion about atheism until he had dismissed the servants, lest in losing their faith, they might lose their morality. 
<laughs> now we've got a real contemporary example of this with Richard Dawkins, his latest confession. He said, I call myself a cultural Christian. Say what? Ricky, what do you <laughs> Richard, I, I don't mean to be disrespectful. I shouldn't call him Ricky. He says, I'm not a believer, but there's a distinction between being a believing Christian and being a cultural Christian which is what he calls himself. I love hymns and Christmas carols. And I sort of feel at home in the Christian ethos. We in the UK, if you're referring to, are a Christian country in that sense. And if I had to choose between Christianity and Islam, I choose Christianity every single time. It seems to me to be a fundamentally decent religion in a way that I think Islam is not. Wow, what a confession. <laughs> That, that was. I appreciate his honesty. And frankly, there are a significant number of well-known atheists that are making, that are leaning towards Christianity in similar ways, right? From Tom Holland, who we've talked about from the beginning in his massive book, Dominion, uh, where he's pointing to Christianity being the source and the cause of all that is good within Western civilization, uh, which was not his thesis when he first started studying the history. Now, this, of course, raises all sorts of other issues, like how Dawkins seems to want the fruit of Christianity without the root, and how he's sitting on the branch that is growing this fruit that he likes very much, but he's been sawing off the branch, this branch, for most of his life. So we will discuss this fruit without the root conundrum in our next episode because it not only has to do with a deeper analysis of the Enlightenment narrative, which I've been criticizing, but also a significant examination of what a Christian response should be to our current culture. For now, the point I want to make is this, that numerous irreligious people have been making similar confessions as Dawkins and noting that the source of much of Western civilization's good features is Christianity. In fact, that is the essential insight that prompted this entire series. And again, journalist uh, Brian Killian has a, has a good way of putting it. He said, despite the fact that the human race is seriously screwed up, Christianity, all considered, has had a remarkable humanizing effect on us. Where humanity has a heart of stone, Christianity has bestowed hearts of flesh. This new humanity amazed a cold pagan world with its warmth. Nevertheless, Christianity is portrayed as the paragon of wickedness. It's rather odd that there can be such a disparity between what Christianity represents and how it's perceived by some, but this paradox goes all the way back to Jesus, who so vexed his contemporaries that many of them found the murderer, Barabbas, preferable to his presence, Jesus' presence. In Western culture, it's Christianity that has produced every single thing that secularists pretend was invented by them, like the idea of human rights, the concept of equality under the law, the affirmation of the goodness of reason, even the development of science is inseparable from Christianity. This is all stuff that we've seen in previous episodes, right? Christians saw the world as an orderly product of an intelligent mind, intelligible to human minds that were made in that one's image. This conception of order and intelligibility undergirds science. Secularism is a parasite that lives off its religious host, offering nothing positive with which to build or sustain a culture. And I'm going to paraphrase this last line of what Killian says here. It is the teaching of Jesus that mitigates the evil that comes from the heart of man. The end of the teaching of Jesus is the beginning hell. So what are the implications of all this information that we've been talking about? Uh, one, I can say the implications for believers and the implications for unbelievers. And I've mentioned this before, so I'm only going to quickly mention this, that for believers, that Christians should have hope and have courage. They should not be hopeless and discouraged. Uh, the kingdom that Jesus talked about has been growing exactly the way he said it would. It would be gradual. It would be very small to begin with, but eventually become the biggest, which is what has happened. Christianity started as a tiny mustard seed, 
and it's grown to be the largest worldview in the world. Uh, the weed and the tares, that is the weed and the weeds, would grow together, which helps explain some of the blemishes. And the gates of hell will not stop until Jesus, uh, uh, the expansion of the kingdom and of the church is completed. So it's working. Jesus' kingdom has been growing just the way Jesus predicted, and it will continue to grow even in the midst of setbacks and blemishes. And, and it may not be the way that we thought it should grow. It may not be as fast as we thought it should grow. Uh, but we've talked about reasons for that. Um, you, can, you can make things happen really quickly with force and coercion and bullying people, but they may be standing up on the outside, but they're sitting down on the inside. And if you want lasting change, it's going to last. It just may take a lot longer when it comes to human beings. So for Christians, you know, Christians should not give up on the Jesus revolution now, despite difficult times. Um, change is happening, and God is using Christians to do it, and we should have tremendous hope. So Christians need to try to influence our culture. We need to be salt and light, as Jesus said, in our culture. But not, but I'm not advocating Christian nationalism. I feel like I have to mention that here because as soon as people mention Christians trying to influence culture, that's kind of the go-to term that pops into people's mind. Uh, but I think the term Christian nationalism is actually just a smear term for the most part. Um, kind of created and emphasized in, in the last four or five years uh, as a smear term for anything that is not radically left. Only a radical secularism calls Christians influencing culture and promoting ideas that have a source in Jesus' teachings, uh, uh, call that nas Christian nationalism. See, I'm not advocating for a theocracy or dominionism or anything like that. I'm advoca advocating for sort of a confident pl pluralism and believe in tolerance and freedom, um, not a Christian nationalism. And so this gets us to this issue of the separation of church and state. Um, a proper and healthy understanding of the separation of church and state does not require discrimination against worldviews that contain God, while allowing all sorts of other worldviews that lack of God. And that is the radical view of the separation of church and state, that, that uh, any influence like by religion, particular Christianity cannot be allowed in the public square. And so this is where our analysis we've been talking about of the dark ages and the myth of religious violence is so relevant. The main reason why radical secularists claim religious ideas must be marginalized and not allowed to influence public policy is actually based on, built upon these myths that religion is intrinsically and uniquely violent whereas non-religious views are not. You remove that assumption, and the radical secular house of cards begins to collapse. So for my irreligious friends, viewers, and listeners, my encouragement to you is to rethink your assumptions, like the Dark Ages and the myth of religious violence. And consider anew the idea that the teachings of Jesus might be not only helpful for human flourishing, when applied with tolerance and freedom, not coercion and bullying and violence, but that it also might be the solution for the problem of the human heart that we've highlighted in this episode. The human heart needs forgiveness and it needs inner transformation. And at this point, I want to um, venture into just a little bit of, of my own story. Uh, I was brought up in a, a church background, a Catholic background, had Catholic school, and it was, uh, so much of it was very, very positive for me. I realized how it laid a foundation of a Christian worldview and, uh, and, and desires in my heart to be good, although, like, Every other person, uh, my heart was <laughs> wicked, and I disobeyed, and I and I fell away. But when I was in university, I was sort of quietly letting 
my Catholicism fade away. I wasn't really rebelling so much. And then I ended up going to an event. I actually thought it was going to be a rock band called Josh. Uh, and it, uh, I misunderstood the advertising. And it ended up being Josh McDowell. Uh, this is back in 1970. And he was uh, the beginning of his ministry. He's gone on to become you know, world famous Christian thinker and apologist. Um, and he grabbed my attention that day uh, with a number of things. Uh, one being there's a difference between knowing about God and knowing God. He had my attention right away there because I knew a lot about God, but I wouldn't have used that uh, terminology that I know God personally. And, um, and then he said, this is the tail end of the student revolution years. And uh, there's a thousand people sitting in the audience and I'm in the very back row, but I felt like he was speaking right to me. And he said, you want to change the world, don't you? And I'm thinking, yes, I do. I was an idealistic young man. I wanted my life to make a difference in the world. And he said, he said, well, you can't because you're part of the problem. Wow. God's Holy Spirit used that line to just cut to the depths of my heart. And I saw my own self-centeredness and sinfulness and my need for two things, forgiveness for what I had done and transformation so that I don't, don't keep on doing the same things. And so because of that, that day I actually turned my life over to Jesus Christ fully and completely and received his forgiveness once for all for all of my sins, past, present, and future, and invited Jesus to be my Lord and Savior. And so that's the point I'm making here is that if you have been building your worldview on these false pillars, of the dark ages, the myth of religious life. I just want to ask you to consider anew that uh, maybe you should revisit the teaching of Jesus. First, for well, first and foremost, for yourself, for the forgiveness that He offers based on His death on the cross for you, and for the inner transformation that He offers based on his rising from the dead with new life, and he offers us new life in, in Christ. And you and I can both testify that this is real. This is not hocus pocus, hocus pocus. Jesus is real and is alive. But also, the application of this is, is, is beyond the individual as well. And maybe the teachings of Jesus are for are good as a culture as well. I don't mean, again, I don't mean imposing Christianity on the culture. I believe in, in democracy. It's not perfect, but it's the best we've got. <laughs> um, and uh, I think Christians should be actively trying to influence people to see that the teachings of Jesus, because they come from a God who loves us, are for our good. And just maybe the branch we're sitting on and enjoying the fruit from, we need to be careful not to saw off. And many irreligious people are recognizing that danger right now and saying there are a lot worse things out there. And if we saw off that branch, the tendency is for human beings to not stop believing crazy things, but believe even more crazy things. So um, this does raise issues, like I mentioned before, about well, uh, the fruit without the root. How can you have the fruit without the root? If you cut the root out, a fruit's not going to last very long. However, I'm am I not saying the very same thing when I say, Christians, you need to influence the culture, but don't impose it upon the culture. So am I suggesting that just a veneer of Christianity is going to be enough to produce fruit? Well, this is where the question gets really tricky, to be quite honest. 
in a certain sense, some of the fruit that we experience in liberal um, Western civilization is a result of Christianity from the root of Christians and people actually deliberately following the teachings of Jesus, but some follows as a result of sort of the veneer, the, the worldview that kind of surrounds it. Um, people who are sort of acting like Christians because of influence, but they aren't actually Christians. And many people are saying, you know, that that isn't going to last. That isn't lasting right now. And so I am I suggesting just to go back to the same thing that we're saying isn't lasting right now? I guess that's my point. That's a difficult question. And that's one that we're going to try to explore next week, especially when we see that a lot of people would say, what do you mean the West has Christian values? It doesn't look like Christian values very much anymore. So um, let me just point my saying this. I encourage my viewers to rethink assumptions that religion is really the cause, Christianity in particular, of our problem, and realize that we ourselves are part of the problem, mm -hmm. that we can become part of the solution, which is what Josh challenged me to do that day by receiving forgiveness and transformation. And then let's also rethink the teachings of Jesus that comes from a God of love just might be what's produced the fruit that we are enjoying right now and are watching dangerously fade away. I think when you're talking about uh, Christian nationalism and versus a good kind of influence, I go back to the way Jesus Christ carried out his ministry in the first century because a lot of his followers, they really did want this let's say, Jesus to take over the government, so to speak. And they were really disillusioned when he did that. Right. But in a, he talked about, he said the kingdom of God is already here in one sense, in the hearts and souls and minds of his, the, those people who truly did, um, let's say, deny themselves, take up the cross daily and follow him. There was something that happened on the inside that actually happened to you when you told about your experience uh, after that um, evening going to see what you thought was going to be a rock band and instead of you experienced a life change the beginnings of a life change so the I think Jesus is a really good example here on how Christians ought to influence in a way they speak to the hearts they speak to the souls they can't, as Jesus did not, he could have forced the overthrow of the Roman Empire within seconds. He could have done that given who he is, but he didn't do that. It's like you mentioned a slow and steady process and he used the term leaven or yeast, how it multiplies throughout the dough. And if you look at any one particular snapshot of that dough, you don't see what's going on, at least not with a naked eye. Mm -hmm. It's a slow thing that changes the dough from the inside. You can punch it and roll it out and whatever, but there's a change happening on the inside. And I think somehow this is the critical thing is that what we're really interested in is change of the individual from the inside. And that solves the problem that Solzhenitsyn talked about is that there, it's on the inside. The problem is on the inside. The, and if the change starts there, then it gradually seeps to the outside. And we've only seen the beginning of what a spread of the kingdom of God can actually do. Mm -hmm. um, just, you know, and it took, you know, 2,000 years, right? Um, but now's not the time to saw the branch off. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, now's not the time to separate ourselves from from the root there's much more that can that can happen and it's not going to be perfect we're we're told in the christian scriptures um, until christ comes back but it yeah. can be oh, moving wait. in it can be moving in that direction kind of like the stock market a little up and down but you know your financial advisor yeah. says keep your money in there because it's long term it's, it's going up and uh, i really think we're at a time in our world right now that um uh we Christians just need to be bright, brightest lights we can be 
and uh, people are beginning are beginning to maybe rethink it and let's just encourage more people to rethink this and then let's get to work together let's find common ground and uh and help produce culture where people really can flourish the way that god wants it. yeah well i'm looking forward to uh your next episode here michael that you said you're going to look at this problem a little the problem of um how did you describe it? Sort of a, how fruit, should we influence? Fruit without the root, the fruit. question mark. <laughs> fruit without the root, yeah. Fruit without the root. I can't help but remember uh, some aspen branches I cut off in the middle of winter and the next summer. They weren't even attached to the trunk, but they all leafed out. But they didn't make it through the summer. There was that yeah. momentum. I think yeah, you told me that before, and I've used that. I've used that example. Yeah. Before, that's good because yeah. you see a little bit of fruit, but it just doesn't last. Yeah, it's just yeah. Uh, slowly dying. It's using up the nutrients that once were readily readily supplied to it, and it slowly yeah. dies. Same with J.D. Unwin. He said when a culture goes through a sexual revolution, the first generation after that, very little change. It's running on the momentum of the generations that came up before that and the people who are still alive from right. the previous generation. It's not until after that generation of ancestors has passed on that 30 40 years down the road you really begin to see the deterioration of that society and so there you have a th this fruit without the root well we'll talk about it more in the next episode but yeah. uh and yeah let's just hold off looking forward to what you have to say there michael thanks again yeah thanks kirk thanks